Hi, today we're going to take a look at the new Sigma FP camera. Now, this is not a review, but we've been playing with this camera for over a month now and we have a couple of thoughts. So let's take a look. Over to you, Mitch. Thanks, Edo. Today, we are looking at the Sigma FP camera released in late 2019. As we have noted, this isn't going to be a review, but more of a list of notes based on our limited experience with the camera from our perspective. Before we start, let us just mention that we've been using the camera with the 1.01 firmware version, which is the latest for the camera at the time of making this video. Let's start with some things that we liked about the camera. The general build quality of this camera is very good. It's made from magnesium, feels solid, and it seems that Sigma did a really nice job overall. The main concept of the FPE in terms of design is to be a semi-modular unit with many potential accessories like grips, flash brackets, and more options for both stills and video shooting. This is not necessarily a novel idea in the camera industry. RED cameras are fairly modular, and to some extent, a few of the medium format cameras on the market, like the Hasselblad H system, are also semi-modular. However, in such a small and affordable package, a semi-modular camera system is certainly refreshing. Another interesting feature, which is a nice touch in the FP, is the stills cine switch on the top part. Many cameras have a video still switch, but the FP has a dedicated cine mode, which is not just a name, but a real thoughtful decision on the part of Sigma's engineers, who see this as a compact cinema camera. And this is reflected in part in the menus, which change completely when set to this mode, including things like the visible timecode, iris setting, and more. One feature which we used a lot, especially in stills mode, was the colors button, which has some nice options, including teal and orange, T and O, forest green, and a few others, as well as a flatter cine mode. There is also a tone curve button, which is very unique, although we can't say that we really played with it too much. Now we can move to our list of things that we think the Sigma needs to address, improve, fix, or change. And as you will see, this one is quite lengthy. As much as we'd like the idea of a modular design in such a small and relatively inexpensive system, which is really refreshing, the problem is, out of the box, the camera is not convenient to use. The FP has no grip and no hot shoe on top, as well as a few other design drawbacks that we shall mention in a moment. Even worse, currently there are just not enough accessories to really justify the design decision to make this camera so tiny and awkward to use out of the box. The small body is not only inconvenient to hold, it also forced Sigma to make a few other design decisions. Very few customizable buttons for serious professional use, no headphone jack, and only a micro HDMI, which is unfortunate for a camera designed primarily for cinema. Even with our small hands and without a grip, the location of some of the buttons didn't feel natural to us, especially the record button. But really what seemed odd was the decision to use a fixed screen on this camera something that is happily becoming less and less common on mirrorless cameras these days, and we would really like to see Sigma change on any future model. The screen is not the only issue here. The FP has no electronic viewfinder, and at least at the moment, we are not aware of one being developed by Sigma, which is really a shame. Sigma does sell a pretty expensive LCD viewfinder called LVF11, but as we see it, that is not a proper substitute for a real electronic viewfinder especially if you have any intention of shooting any stills with the camera. Although the layout of the menus is actually not that bad, navigating them didn't feel too intuitive to us. Plus, you can't use the touchscreen for changing settings, not even in the nice big icon quick select menu for some reason. The FP has no on-sensor image stabilization, only lens or digital image stabilization. We're not sure if this is a cost or a size issue, or both, but either way, it's something that we would like to see in any future Sigma camera, even if this means a more expensive and larger body. The camera only seems to have a mechanical shutter. We're not 100% sure, but we feel that this might have caused some flickering in some situations. Power is another huge drawback of this camera. It uses the tiny BP51 battery with 1200 milliamp hour, which is officially rated at up to 280 images and a pretty short video recording, especially in 4K RAW. The worst thing is that you can't power it on the go using a USB-C connection, which is a really strange decision on Sigma's part. 
You will need to get a ton of batteries, or possibly a dummy battery, if you're thinking of shooting a full day of video with this camera. Talking about the battery, the battery compartment is way too close to the quarter-inch thread at the bottom of the camera, which means that when we connect our RC2 quick-release plate, we can't open the battery door. One bizarre omission that we encountered with the FP has to do with the audio level meters, or rather, the lack of those in the settings. There is audio recording option in the menu, but we found no way to display levels. According to the user manual, this should be a part of the shoot menu in cine mode, but we couldn't find it anywhere. Although we couldn't view the raw video footage from the camera, more on this in a moment, we did record some 4K raw videos with the camera only to discover that even with a fast UHS-2 SD memory card, you can't really record more than a few seconds at a time. If you want to record long 4K raw footage, you will need to connect the camera directly to a fast SSD, like the Lacie Rugged SSD Pro that we recently tested. One of the biggest drawbacks of this camera in our view has to do with the autofocus system. If you only shoot with manual focus, then this might not be a big issue for you. But in 2020, there are just so many amazing autofocus camera systems around that the slow, contrast-based system on the Sigma FP with its limited functionality just feels like a huge step backwards to us. Much like going back to where the camera industry was 5 or even 10 years ago. A few other things did not work the way we expected with the camera including the zebras, which worked in the menu but not when shooting. The focus peaking, which did work, but was not clear or prominent enough in our view. And finally, a rather unusual behavior, where the images on the screen of the camera looked much better than on our computer. There are more things that we think that Sigma needs to change or fix, but these are the big ones in our view. As we have noted at the beginning of this hands-on, we are not the target audience for this camera and we will probably never consider buying it even if most of these issues were fixed, since our workflow at the moment has no need for 4K raw video or even 10-bit shooting, which are the two main highlights of the FP camera besides its compact and modular build. More importantly, we have no use for Cinema DNG, which is the format that Sigma chose for raw shooting with the camera that at the moment doesn't seem to work with Premiere Pro on our PC. Even if it does work on your system and editing software, you will have to take into account huge files, which make the whole thing really a pain to use and edit. Recording with this camera using the MOV format doesn't do it justice, as Rubidium Wu from Crimson Engine recently demonstrated in his comparative video, looking at 8-bit, 10-bit and 12-bit video files both in RAW and MOV format on the Sigma FP. Since we couldn't open the Cinema DNG files we shot in Premiere Pro, we can't really talk about image quality, but you should really watch Rubidium's video to get appreciation of what the camera can and can't do in terms of image quality. For our workflow, we would much rather have a camera that shoots 4K 60p or even 6K 24p with a decent quality and good compression instead of these huge 4K 30p Cinema DNG RAW files. On the other hand, there are some people that seem to be very enthusiastic about this camera, so it might have a niche audience after all. We want to conclude with a positive note. Despite the long list of drawbacks and missing features that we've mentioned, we are actually pleasantly surprised by what Sigma was able to do here. Although the company produced cameras in the past, Sigma was never really a camera manufacturer. The FP, however, is a real pro-level camera, and despite feeling like a first-generation product in many respects, it shows some of the potential of what Sigma can do, at least if it gives its engineers enough resources and room to play. It will be interesting to see what Sigma will announce next, especially with its upcoming full-frame Foveon sensor. Back to you, Ido. So these were our thoughts on the Sigma FP. Again, this is not a review, but a few notes after using it for over a month. You can read the full article on lensv.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel to find more videos just like this. See you next time.